God made us with a conscience, that little voice that's inside of us that speaks to us every day. Sometimes it nags at us. Sometimes it speaks kindly. Sometimes it is harsh. We all live as humans. And I think the words of the Lord Jesus about the nature of mankind is probably the most correct statement when he said the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26 and verse 41. Each of us lives with that nagging reality of sin. We wonder and we worry at times if we can live the Christian life, if we can be the kind of people that God wants us to be and be able to live with the Lord Jesus in days to come, in eternity, in heaven with Him forever and ever. Sometimes it even affects how people see Jesus and how they see their own lives, whether or not they will come to Him. I hear people say now and then, you know, when I get over all of my problems, whenever I can get myself all straightened up, then I'll think about coming to Jesus. And you figure that uh, they're thinking they don't want to lapse back into sin. But they made a mistake when they say that. If you think that you'll be able to overcome all your problems by yourself, you're only fooling yourself. We need Jesus. Why not let Jesus help you? Why not let Him help you to overcome whatever problems, whatever sin, and whatever temptations that face you? help you to be the kind of person that you need to be. Someone says, well, Phil, you don't understand. I've got a really bad problem. Do you think Jesus would help even me? That he would help me? And the answer to that question is yes. A thousand times yes, he will help you if you will let him. Will you let him? I love the scriptures and I love Jesus because he understands us in so many mighty ways I think of the words of John when he wrote in John 2 in verse 25 that Jesus didn't need anyone to bear witness concerning man for he himself knew what was in man and he knows what's in you and he knows what is in me And you know what in spite of the fact that he knows us so well he still loves us And He's still patient with us and caring towards us. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, you remember in verse 15 that the Hebrew writer says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, in every way, in all points, like we are, and yet without sin. And so he says, Let us therefore... Draw near with confidence, with boldness to that throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in that time of need. Some people, whenever they've done something wrong, run away. They think they could run away from God. But you know what? Whenever we're being tempted, whenever things are tough, the thing that we need to do is to run to God so that He can help us to overcome those problems. The year was 1935 before I was born. And in my memory is a picture of eight children standing in a row from the oldest to the youngest And the oldest is a girl, 16 years old, and the youngest is a boy, about three. They are standing there, but there are not smiles on their faces. They are dressed in fine clothes, and they are looking into the grave of their father. Their father, who was murdered, shot in the head right there. There was the eight of them. Dad was dead. Mother had been trained as a nurse, and so she went to work at the hospital. While the children did the best that they could, the oldest did the best they could to take care of the younger ones when mother was working, but it was very difficult. 
And they had their own lives to lead, and so as they got older, the younger ones sometimes were a little neglected, especially the youngest boy. And he grew up on the street, and he lived like a boy who grew up on the street lived. He learned to fight, he learned to cuss, he learned to drink and smoke, and he learned to steal. And he loved to steal. And even when he had money in his pocket later in life, if he could steal something, he would. He got uh, a little older, and he loved to go out and do things that boys that live on the street do. He got drunk one night and got into a fight, and they threw him in jail. And uh, he went to, to the jail, and he tore everything that was in the jail out of the walls tore everything up. He was so angry. The jailer called his brothers and said, come get him. We can't do anything with him. But the judge heard about it and said to him, he said, young man, you're going to have to restore what you've done and you can do one of two things. You can either go into the military or you can go into prison. Which will it be? Well, he chose the army and I'm glad he did. He served honorably and it would be a blessing to him later in life. But after he got out of the military, he began his other sordid ways. And he began to run with other men who made thievery a way of life. He said he had committed every crime that a man could commit except he had never killed anybody. He was wanted in seven states. And was always looking over his shoulder and always looking for some way to take something that belonged to someone else. Once in a while, he would come home to see his mama, and one time he had come home, and he decided that he would break into a business. He stole a check-writing machine and some checks and liked to bankrupt the company. Well, he made a mistake of hiding the machine in the doghouse. And whenever it was discovered, his mother called the law, and they came and arrested him, and he served four years in prison in Lansing, Kansas. During that time, his older sister, the oldest, and her husband went to visit with him to try to teach him the gospel, to teach him what to do to be saved. He began to study his Bible. He began to worship a little bit. He began to run with others, and there were other members of the church that were there. But he had not been baptized according to the teaching of the Scriptures. He never got around to being baptized during that period of time. When he got out, he was on parole for a long time. He had a hard time finding a job. And so he went to work out in the oil field. He ran with a rough group of people and took illegal drugs and frequently got drunk. And he had a bad mouth and lived a bad way. I remember in 1985, when my father died, that he and his good wife came to the funeral. But his mouth was so foul, and his ways were so ungodly. And it was at a time when my children were still little, Jonathan. And I said in my heart, you know, if I never see this guy again, it'll be all right. I cannot tell you how much I regret those words. It was two years later in the summer on a Friday night, he called me. I thought that was strange. Called me out of the blue. I hadn't talked to him in two years. And he said, Phil, I want you to come to my house. And he said, I want you to teach me about baptism. And I thought that was strange. And there were a lot of things I didn't know. He had gone to the doctor and he had gained up to 400 pounds. He had gone to the doctor, and the doctor told him if he didn't quit his drinking and smoking, and if he didn't straighten up and lose some weight, that he'd die. Well, he was still a relatively young man at that point, and he began to look back at his past, and he began to say, you know, I had made promises back when I was in prison, and I haven't kept any of those promises. And his conscience began to prick at him and eat at him, 
And he went around to every church in the small town where he lived and he knocked on the door and tried to find preachers and tried to find someone to teach him about baptism and nobody had time for him. They didn't have any time for him at all. Well, he called me and I lived some 40, 50 miles away. I said to him, I said, okay, I'll be there tomorrow. I've got to take Jackie and the girls over to her folks' house. And that's right on the way up to see you, and I'll be there in the morning. So I took Jackie and the girls up to her folks' house. I went on up to his house. I got out of the car with this very Bible that I have in my hand, and I walked into his house. And he was not alone. His wife was there, and there were three others there five people and he said okay teach me about baptism and so we began and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a few of the things that I told him we studied for several hours and you're going to get the reader's digest version but it will be I think pretty thorough in spite of the fact it'll be short so get your bible out we're going to be working pretty hard for the next little bit we began in the book of Matthew Chapter 3, when Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be baptized. Now, the baptism of John the Baptist, according to Luke 3 and verse 3, and Mark 1 and verse 4, was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And when he baptized people, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Mark 1 and verse 9. Well, whenever Jesus came to him, you remember John tried to prevent him from being baptized. He said, well, I I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus said, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. He let him. Well, after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And I think about that situation. Jesus walked from his home in Nazareth down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John because he wanted to do what was the right thing, that it was fitting for him to fulfill all righteousness. Now, we've already seen from Hebrews 4 that he didn't have any sin, and he didn't need the forgiveness of sins because no sin was in him. But he wanted to do the right thing, and he wanted to set the right example, and he wanted people to know that he was going to do what God wanted the people to do at that particular time, and he was baptized. Now, there were others who were not baptized. In the book of uh, Luke, chapter 7, Verses 29 and 30. You remember that some came to John, and it said there that when all the people and the tax gatherers, that is the publicans, heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. When people refuse to do what God wants them to do, they're refusing God's purpose for themselves. And Jesus was not going to do that. He wanted to fulfill all righteousness. From there, we went to the end of the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus, you remember in those last words after his resurrection and before his ascension, said, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. He said, all authority is given to me. I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to baptize them, and I want you to keep teaching them. That's the Great Commission. And there is a parallel to that found in the book of Mark, chapter 16. Verses 15 and 16, where Jesus says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. That's very clear, that it takes both baptism and faith before one is saved. Now, there are six times in Scripture where the word baptism and something having to do with salvation are found in the same sentence in the same place. 
Do you know that in every occasion where salvation and baptism are found in the same place, the baptism always comes first. Always. Now, why does it say that he who disbelieves shall be condemned but doesn't say anything about baptism? Because if you don't believe, you're not going to be baptized. That's why. Well, from there, we went to the book of John, the gospel according to John, chapter 3. And we found that Jesus had uh, had a, a conversation with a fellow named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, of course, came to him by night, and he said, We know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. And you remember that Jesus makes the statement to him, and he says to him, uh, Truly, truly, I say to you that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You've got to be born again. Well, Nicodemus asked the question, well, how, how can I be born again? I, I'm, I'm an old fella. And he says, I can't enter into my mother's womb a second time, can I? And so Jesus answers and he says, truly, truly, I say to you that except a man be born of water and the Spirit, He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's a very categorical statement, a very strong statement. He begins by saying, truly, truly, I say to you. King James would use the words, verily, verily, I say to you. In the original language, it's amen, amen, I say to you. Jesus meant what he was talking about. And he said, except a person is born of water and the Spirit, He cannot, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's impossible for him to enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Every ancient author that ever lived knew that that birth of water and the Spirit was speaking about baptism. And nobody ever doubted it. Nobody ever questioned it. And it was not until the 1500s that people began to question about whether or not that was the case. But prior to that time, nobody did. Everybody understood that baptism was necessary for a person to enter the kingdom of God. Later on in the same chapter, in verse 23, it says, And John also was baptizing in Enon near Salem. And he says, Because there was much water there. Well, whatever baptism is, it requires much water. From there we went into the book of Acts chapter 2 and we saw about the the day of Pentecost and how Peter with the eleven stood there and they began to preach. Of course, they were inspired of God. The tongues were upon their heads for a time. They were speaking in the other tongues. People were hearing this and they were quite taken and amazed by what was taking place that these Galileans were speaking other languages. And so they were listening And Peter and the others preached about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he talked about how that he had been crucified by lawless hands and how that they were responsible for his death. He talks about his resurrection and how they were eyewitnesses of his resurrection and how God did not abandon his soul to Hades, nor did his body undergo decay. And he finished up the sermon by saying in verse 36, He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. And then he said, this Jesus, and he pointed his finger at the people, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now here was a situation where he had quoted scripture, where they had seen something miraculous, where men stood side by side as witnesses. And the people's hearts were convicted. They were guilty men. What shall we do? And the answer was repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children to all them that are far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. 
And then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. Well, what did the guilty people ask? What are we going to do? What was the answer? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What was the purpose of it? So that your sins would be forgiven. Do you remember when we started this and we talked about Mark 1 verse 4 and Luke 3 and verse 3 that the baptism of Jesus was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Yes, that's what we said. And now we have this same phrase found in Acts 2 and verse 38, for the forgiveness of sins. But there is a fourth time in which that phrase is found, and that's in Matthew 26 and verse 28. Whenever Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, and He comes to the cup, and He talks about how that that reminds us of the blood which was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. You know, Peter was present whenever Jesus said that. And that was only 50 days before, G, before Peter said it. Just 50 days earlier. That phrase didn't change meanings. Whatever it meant in Matthew 26 and verse 28 is what it meant in Acts 2 and verse 38. If Jesus shed His blood so that people could have their sins forgiven, then people repent and are baptized so that they can have their sins forgiven. And that's the meaning of that phrase. In fact, there have been nearly 15 English translations that have come out in the last 50 years that when they translated Acts 2 and verse 38, translated it so that your sins may be forgiven or something similar to that, that it made it very clear that baptism was the time in which a person was saved and their sins were forgiven. Yes, that's part of what repentance and baptism are for, the forgiveness of of sins. From there we went over into the book of Acts chapter 8 and Philip had gone into Samaria and he was working miracles and the people were rejoicing and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And in Acts 8 and verse 12 it says, but when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized. And then it says both men and women alike. Well, who was being baptized? Men and women, the word for men, the word on air, a male of full age and stature. The word for women, gene, a female of full age and stature. We're not talking about little kids and we're not talking about babies. We're talking about people who are old enough to understand the preaching of the gospel, old enough to believe and old enough to repent. These are the ones who were being baptized. In the book of Acts chapter 5 and verse 14, there is also a statement about who was in the church and it talks about men and women. And again, these are specific terms. Not only are they of the two genders, but also someone who is old enough to be thought of as being mature enough to make those decisions. We looked a little farther into the book of Acts chapter 8 and we find out about an angel of the Lord telling Philip to go down south to Gaza. And uh, as he's on the way, he runs across a, a eunuch from Ethiopia. And uh, this man is reading from the Scriptures, from the book of Isaiah. And he gets to chapter 53. Well, then the Spirit told Philip to go and join himself to that chariot. And he asked the man if he understands what he's reading. And the man says, well, how can I except someone guide me? And so they began to look at the passage and he says, well, who's, who's this talking about? He's talking about himself or somebody else. And in verse 35, it says that Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, Isaiah 53. Now, they didn't have chapters in those days, but that was the scripture. The Bible says that he preached Jesus to him. Isn't that interesting? He preached Jesus to him. Wouldn't it have been something to hear that sermon? I would love to know all the things that he said. That sermon is not recorded here. We know he talked about Jesus. I suspect about his death, burial, and resurrection. Because it says he gospelized Jesus to him. The word euangelizomized there. The word for gospel. But there is one thing I know that he taught. He taught baptism. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, 
Well, how did he know? Well, he learned it from Philip. He said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe, you may. And he confessed his faith. And they both went down into the water. He ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. Now, baptism is a part of preaching Jesus, and it's a part of preaching the gospel. And when he baptized him, they both went down into the water. Then he baptized him. And then they both came up out of the water. Now, we know that they required much water for baptism. And I know it meant going down into it and coming up out of it. So whatever baptism is, it's done inside the water. Because you remember John the Baptist baptized in the Jordan River. And that's important to recall and to remember. Well, we turn the page to chapter 9. And here we have Saul of Tarsus breathing threats. He's making threats and putting some of the disciples into prison. And he had gone to the high priest, asked for letters to take to Damascus, that if he found anybody there from the way, he could arrest them and bring them bound back to Jerusalem. Verse 3, and it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and it shall be told you what you must do. I've been reading that passage for 50 years. And there isn't anything in those first six verses about Saul of Tarsus being saved on the road to Damascus. All that it says there is Jesus told him, you go into town, you go into Damascus, and you'll be told there what you must do. He didn't say he was saved. Not one thing there. In fact, I know that he was not saved. Now verse 9 says that he was there three days without sight. And uh, he neither ate nor drank. He was fasting during that time. Verse 11 says that he was praying. I don't believe that was a willy-nilly prayer. I believe that was the most serious prayer that Saul of Tarsus had ever prayed in his life. He had been persecuting the church. He had been blaspheming the Lord. He had been doing all of these things. And don't you know he was praying, praying, praying. But he's not saved yet. And someone says, well, Phil, how do you know that? Well, turn with me to Acts 22 and verse 16, where now he's the apostle Paul, and he tells about his conversion experience, what he, how he was saved, what he needed to do, and what was told him that he must do. Acts 22 and verse 16. And there you remember verse 13, it says that, Ananias came to him and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. Someone says, well, see, he's saved because he called him Brother Saul. Well, he called him Brother Saul because he was a fellow Jew. Ananias was afraid of him. He called him Brother Saul. Jews called each other brother. You remember men and brethren, what shall we do? Those weren't members of the church. Jews had already been calling each other brother a long time. Brother Saul, receive your sight. And I, he says, at that time, I, I looked up at him. And he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. And now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Be baptized and wash away your sins. Now at the Sanders house, when we wash our clothes, we wash the dirty ones. We don't wash the clean ones. We wash the dirty ones. Why? Because they're dirty. And Saul still had a dirty soul that needed to be washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. And how did that take place? It took place when he was baptized. 
Someone says, well, Phil, surely you don't believe in water baptism, that that's what saves and water regeneration. Don't you believe that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin? Certainly I do. And in the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, we see how that baptism and the blood are connected. Verse 3, or do you not know? That all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death. And therefore we've been buried with Him through baptism into death. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, even so we also might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, and here's the point, that our old self, was crucified with Him. That's when we came in contact with that blood. Our old self, our old man of sin was crucified with Him. Why? That our body of sin might be done away with so that we'd no longer be slaves of sin. For he who died is freed from sin. The purpose of the baptism was to be crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, raised with Christ, so that we could be free from sin and could be new creatures and have newness of life. That's the purpose of it. Now there is a parallel passage to this found in the book of Colossians, chapter 2. And in that passage, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear about how that baptism is both a burial and a resurrection. Now we know why they went down into the water and why they came up out of the water. Because going down into the water, they would be buried with Christ. And then coming up out of the water, they would be raised with Christ. And baptism as an immersion, that's what the word means, to immerse, to dip, to plunge. And everyone understood that in ancient times. In fact, there was a fellow named A.E. Conant. And in the 1800s, he did a great deal of research, found more than 200 instances where the word baptizo or other phrases like that, other parts of that word were used. And in all 200 occasions, he understood that the word meant to immerse, to dip, to plunge, to completely submerge underneath. Generally, what was talked about was water. And yes, that's what we're baptized in, water. Behold, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? The River Jordan. Yes, baptism is a baptism in water. But in Colossians 2 and verse 12, he says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith, faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive. He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Someone says, Phil, don't you understand that baptism is a work and we're not saved by works? Well, now I know that none of us can earn our way to heaven. And I will tell you very clearly that baptism is a work but not what you think, not what you think. Let's look at that commandment, be baptized, Acts 2, 38, 22, 16. Be baptized. Now, grammatically, that is a passive imperative. Well, what in the world is a passive imperative? That means you let somebody do something to you. An active imperative means you do something. A passive imperative means you let somebody do something to you. Now, when Jonathan is up here in the baptistry and he's baptizing somebody, the person being baptized just kind of stands there and lets him. And I'll guarantee you, Jonathan is the one doing the work. He's the one who's putting that person under the water and bringing him back up. You know that, Sam. That's the way it is in baptism. The baptizer is the worker, and the baptizee is the one worked on. And just like that in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense, God is the one who is at work in baptism. 
Now think with me just a little bit. It's God who forgives your sins. It's God who washes you clean. It's God who saves you and rescues you. It is Jesus and His blood that paid the price for you. And in His death, in His blood that washed you clean. It's God who buries you with Christ. It is God who raises you with Christ. It is God who adds you to the church. It is God who makes you His child. Galatians 3, 27. It's God who is at work in baptism. And you are passive. You aren't doing anything. God and the baptizer are the ones working on you. When I hear somebody say, oh, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. The thing that I come back with is this. Why in the world are you interfering with the work of God? It's God who is at work, not man, in baptism. Well, we began to discuss other passages like Ephesians 5 and Titus 3 and 1 Peter 3, 21. That baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. But an appeal, and that's how that should be translated. But an appeal to God for a good conscience. You see, when we're calling on His name, we're appealing for a good conscience. We want to have a clean conscience. And baptism is a way of praying to God for that clean conscience. And God gives us one. And I'm thankful for that. Well, after we had finished our study, we all changed our clothes and we walked down into the pond that was behind the house. It was a warm summer day and the water was as warm as a baptistry. And I baptized him and I baptized his wife and I baptized three others that day. I never saw such a change in a man's life in my whole life as I saw in him. I never heard another curse word. He never took another drink. He never smoked another cigarette. He never did anything like he had done before. And I will tell you the rest of the story in a little bit. The question that we're asking is, will Jesus really help us? And so the question is, how is He going to help us? Well, He's going to help us by forgiving us all our sins. And He shed His blood on the cross in order to be able to do that. Sometimes people ask the question, well, did Jesus really forgive me when I was baptized? Did He really forgive me? Well, my answer to that is He says He will. And Jesus keeps His promises. Hebrews 8 and verse 12, you remember the covenant promise. He says, For I will be merciful to their iniquities and their sins will I remember no more. And when we're saved, when we're baptized, God doesn't remember those sins anymore. They're no longer important to Him. Now i got a scar right there on my chin. My brother Joe gave me that scar when I was 10 years old. I had to have five stitches. And it scared me when they brought that needle to put it in my chin to deaden the pain. I was glad they did. I was scarred from here and on my arms. A few weeks later, my brother through a kind of an odd thing, caused me to split my side open. I'll not show that scar. But it was the same brother. That was my brother Joe. I love my brother Joe. And though these scars are still with me after 55 years, 57 years, I don't care. I don't care one whit. They don't mean anything to me. If you want to ask what does forgiveness mean, in the book of 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20, one of the things that is said there is that He does not count our trespasses against us. Folks, that's forgiveness. And when I see my brother Joe, I don't say, you dirty rotten rat, you gave me scars. 
No, I just don't care. And when God looks down at us, even though we may have had a past that is as ugly as it could be, what we were and what we are are two different things. And when He forgives us, the past is gone. For I will be merciful to their iniquities and their sins will I remember no more. But that doesn't mean He forgets you. He still loves you. He still cares about you. If God could forgive the wicked people that crucified Jesus on the day of Pentecost, and if He could forgive the Apostle Paul, the chief of sinners, He can forgive you. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9 through 11, it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he said, Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he points his finger at some of the folks at the church in Corinth. He says, And such were some of you. You lived like that. But you were justified. You were washed, rather. God cleaned you up. You were sanctified. God made you holy. And you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of our God. God can change a man, can transform a person, can take what he was and make him into the person he wants him to be. And forgiveness is not just putting away the sin. It's all that goes with it of justifying and washing and sanctifying that person and helping them to become somebody different so that they have newness of life and they are born again. Oh, that's the message of the gospel. Not only does He free us from sin, He frees us from the consequences and the enslavement of sin. John 8, 34 says the one who commits sin is the slave of sin. But verse 36 says that if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. You're going to be really free. You're going to be free from that sin. We talked last night about Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. But thanks be to God that whereas you were the slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, what was taught to you, you did it right. That form of doctrine that was delivered to you and being then made free from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. Here were people who were slaves of sin, but they didn't stay there. God had a way that they could become the slaves of righteousness. People can change and don't let anybody, don't let anybody tell you that people cannot change. They can. Not only does He free us from sin, He gives us a special help as Christians. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I tell you, God is going to be there for you. He's going to provide a way of escape if it's too tough for you. He's going to help you. And this is a promise of God. And that's how He helps us to overcome those things. Second, whenever He is with us, He gives us an abundant life. Whenever we've lost, left the the life of sin and we come to a life of righteousness, that's an abundant life. Oh yes, the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. John 10 and verse 10. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. When we become Christians and we come into Christ, There are blessings that are there that are spiritual. Every one of them that's in the heavenly places are ours now. We have an abundant life with spiritual blessings. I think of Ephesians 3 verses 20 and 21. And there Paul, after he had prayed a little bit, has to just stop and praise God for a little bit. And he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God can do more than we ask or think and I have seen that with my own eyes. 
someone says, well, how does he do all that? How does he give us this abundant life? How, how, how do we have these spiritual blessings? How does he do all these things? I don't know. I know that he gives us his word and he keeps his promises. I know that he answers prayer. I know that providence is at work in our lives as long as we live. But you know what? There are a lot of things I don't know. And there are a lot of things that God does that we can't see. I don't know how a brown cow can eat green grass that makes white milk that makes yellow butter. But I put butter on my biscuit. I don't know how my car works, but I got places. I don't know how an airplane flies, but I came. I don't know how television works, but it does. You know what? We don't have to know every little thing. We don't have to know everything that God does. I don't know how angels minister to us. I don't know how my spirit dwells within my body, my spirit. I don't have to know. I just have to believe that whatever God says is true and is right. To believe it, to accept it, and to teach it to other people. Sometimes what we need is faith to believe, to believe. And I also know that He's going to help us by giving us each other. Yeah, each other. Paul in that same prayer in Ephesians 3 prayed that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Well, if Christ is dwelling in your heart and in my heart through faith, Shouldn't we be able to see something of Christ in one another? Shouldn't we be able to see something of Jesus that keeps us strong and keeps us wanting to do what is right and keeps us loving? Shouldn't there be something that's there? When Jackie and I got married, we had some words inscribed in our rings, our wedding rings that was popular in those days. And we chose the phrase from Ephesians 4 and verse 9, two are better than one. And if I could get my ring off, I'd show it to you. My knuckle's too big, hadn't been off my hand in years. He says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, one will lift up his companion but woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. And it goes on to say that a threefold strand is not easily broken. And I think back through my life and how often a brother or sister has helped me in a time of weakness to remain strong. And I think about my good wife and how she has made a better man out of me. And my love for her has been an important part of our lives together just as her love for me and my love for her. I think about Christians and how badly they need each other to keep their fires warm and to keep close to each other. And I think of Galatians 6 verses 1 and 2. Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. I never saw such a change in a person in my life. No foul words. No drunkenness. He was a man who spent his time reading the scriptures. And praying and singing hymns of praise, and thinking about how he could help somebody. And he had the idea that he could go over to Guthrie, to the county seat. And he'd go over there and ask the sheriff if he could go in and preach to the prisoners, and he did. The sheriff led him. It wasn't long till those prisoners were wanting to be baptized. Well, they didn't have a baptistry in that little county jail. But there was a farmer who had a pickup and had one of those cow 
tanks, you know, that you could put in the back of a pickup. So they hauled it over there. They put it in the, in the jail yard. They closed the gate. They filled it full of cold water, and they baptized them. And the sheriff was glad because those prisoners were gentle after that. And he said, you know, if I can teach somebody in Guthrie, I could go to Okarchi, and I could go to Watonga and some other places. And so he began to go over there and preach. And the sheriffs loved him because their people in jail were kind after that. Then he heard about the state prison, and he began to go to various state prisons. He went down to McAllister and down to Granite and various other places where he would go in and he would preach to the prisoners. When he went into McAllister, he decided he wanted to go to death row. And he began to try to teach everybody that was on death row in McAllister. And many of them became members of the church. They didn't start out that way, but they ended their lives that way. He even went to those who were in the part of the prison where they had people who were insane that they couldn't let them out of the jail cell because they were so wild. One man, they told him, don't you get near those bars. If he gets a hold of you, he'll choke you to death. And so he stood over the wall across the way and talked to him. And the man with tears in his eyes said to Kurt, he said, You're the first person that said a kind word to me in a couple of years. He talked about how he was going to take his life. The man began to study the Bible, began to change his ways. Six months later, he was out of that part of the prison, and he was back with the other prisoners. During his time, from the time he was baptized in 1987... Until his death in 2005, he baptized more than 1,100 people with his own hands. Perhaps you remember the name Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, the fellow up in Wisconsin, the one who was a murderer, a homosexual, and a cannibal. And he was a serial killer. When they caught him, they put him in prison. What you may not know about Jeffrey Dahmer is that up until the age of 11 that he attended the Church of Christ. When his mother and father divorced, he stopped going to church. and He got in with the wrong crowd and did a lot of the wrong things. And he lived a life that was terrible. But there was a lady named Mott, M-O-T-T, who lived in Virginia, who sent him a world Bible school Bible study. And at the same time, there was another world Bible school Bible study that was sent by Curtis Booth of Crescent, Oklahoma. And Jeffrey Dahmer studied through both of those lessons, both of those booklets, multiple lessons. And in April 1994, he wrote a letter saying that I have finished these courses And I know that I need to be and I want to be baptized. Then he began to describe a situation where he wanted that and where he wanted to be a part of the the Lord's church and to come back home. Well, Kurt got on the phone and he called and he found a brother. um, And I always get the name wrong and I apologize for that. A brother up in Wisconsin who went in and baptized him. And came and visited with him on the Lord's day from then until the time when he died some months later. But here was a man who had worked so hard and had reached so many people. Do you remember the picture of the eight children standing in a row? from the oldest to the youngest. The oldest girl who was behind the scenes in all of this was my mama. And the one who was murdered was my grandfather. And the one who was the little three-year-old boy 
was my Uncle Kurt. And I'm sure it was my mother who told him to call me. And I said in my heart, if I never see that man again, <laughs> it will be all right. And I have to tell you, I couldn't have been more wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong than I was that day. And I was wrong for two reasons. I was wrong because I judged another man's soul of being unworthy of hearing the gospel. And I was wrong because I doubted the power of God to make a difference in a person's life. And in the power of God to make a difference even in my life. It was me who learned the lesson in that situation. And I thought about that saying, I'm not all I ought to be, and I'm not. I'm not all I want to be. I'm not all I'm going to be. But thank God, by His mercy and grace, I'm not what I used to be. Folks, that's what it means to come to God. And to let Him transform your life. He can take the worst evil man, the chief of sinners, and turn him into a saint. He can clean us up. He can make us holy. He can make us righteous. We can be His children. And we can live with Him forever and ever. God can transform your life if you will let Him. But you have to let Him. You have to let Him work on you. You have to let His Word work in your life. You have to pray and know that He'll answer. You have to believe the things that He says. And you've got to be obedient to His will. Oh, I don't know what kind of life you're living, but if you're living a life with sin in it, stop. And get your life right with God. If you're not a Christian, we've talked about what to do to be saved. To believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ. To repent of your sins. To confess His name and to be baptized into Christ. When you're baptized, God baptizes you. He is the one who buries you and raises you. and He's the one who unites you with Christ. Let God work on you. If you need to become a Christian, do so tonight. If you're a brother or sister and you've got a problem, let Jesus help you while we stand and sing.